All right. Um, has the recording started, Peggy? Yes, it has. OK, awesome. Uh, once the screen just loads. All right, I'm going to start with this. Uh, hey, welcome, everybody. Welcome to the MEC session, the Microsoft Exchange Community uh, event. Today's uh, session is the Ask the Experts from Microsoft Defender for Office 365. My name is Urja Gandhi, and I'm a product manager on the MDO team. And for those of you who noticed on the website for this session, um, the description wasn't in, wasn't correct. Uh, so um, I'm going to post an accurate description of this session in the chat. And uh, as it is the AMA, uh, you know, we'll welcome any questions that you have. Please feel free to post them in the chat, and we'll uh, open up the floor for AMA. Just after our leader here, Girish, uh, introduces uh, all of us to the product MDU. Off to Thank you, Girish. You. Thank you, Urja. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Super excited to be back here at MEC. Uh, wow, it's been a while since this forum happened, I think. Uh, great to talk to you all. Uh, my name is Girish Chander, as uh, Urja mentioned. Uh, I run the product team for Defender for Office 365. And with me is the most of the product team. If you go to the next slide, um, if this session was happening in person, I think folks here on this uh, slide would actually show up in force. Uh, credit to Uja for putting the slide up together. This serves as the next best proxy where you can actually put uh, faces to the names of some of the folks you'll be hearing from today. Uh, my goal over the next few minutes is actually quite simple. I want to keep this short. I want to introduce you to Defender for Office 365 for those of you who do not know, um, and uh, then open it up and reserve a lot of time for any Q&A you might have. So uh, our beginnings in Defender for Office 365 actually happened uh, from Mailflow, from the exchange side of the house, within the transport team, in fact. Um, and then sometime in the middle of the previous decade, uh, we started noticing a troubling trend, whereas you know, prior to that, a large percentage of, you know, uh, problems over email flow was oriented around spam. We started seeing this massive shift towards ransomware, malware, advanced threats, uh, phishing attacks, business email compromise attacks. And we knew we had to pivot strongly towards protecting customers from this advanced uh, trends of attacks. David, if you go to the next slide. Um, and what started that journey there, if you... Uh, a few years ago um, has actually only sustained an importance and in fact grown in importance uh, over the over the past few years. Uh, the pandemic, for example, has fundamentally changed the way we all work, as you can all know, as you all know. Uh, and this this blend of remote and now hybrid functioning has really thrown open what we used to consider traditional uh, parameters of organizations. Uh, people are more collaborative. They're using a lot more productivity and collaborative tool sets. This has therefore expanded our uh, focus and need to do, a, to do better in terms of protecting users where they are, whatever apps they use, whatever toolkits they use. And this conventional notion of security that you could actually draw a hard perimeter around your workforce and strengthen those walls and protect everybody on the inside, that was already crumbling before the pandemic. And the pandemic, if anything, has only accelerated that crumbling. Uh, and so this notion of perimeter based security just doesn't work. Uh, and email had this weird way of penetrating perimeters in any event. Uh, but now with the proliferation of things like teams and in obviously widening use of email, our charter within Office 365 to protect users across Office 365 from advanced threats has only grown in importance. You then pair that with uh, stats. In fact, if I'm if I'm recalling the stat correctly, uh, I think last year the FBI projected I think we lost about forty three billion dollars in cybercrime just in the U.S. Uh, and so the cost of breaches are increasing dramatically. You pair that with another stat that says ninety one percent of attacks that come into an organization are actually coming in through email. And now you begin to realize, oh my God, this, this focus on protecting email, protecting Office 365 from advanced threats and therefore protecting organizations, their data, their assets is so vitally important. And that's the charter that keeps us going. That's the charter that we started off with when we formed Defender for Office 365. 
And that's the one that we take to heart, and it's super important in the work that we do day in and day out. If you go to the next slide, David. So this slide is really meant to give you this one slide view into what encompasses Defender for Office 365. Uh, MDO for short, so I'll just start using that abbreviation. Um, on the left, you'll see the different pivots uh, of our focus. You know, starting with prevention, we've got to block these attacks to the, to the maximal extent possible. Whether we're talking about advanced malware, ransomware, business email compromise, credential theft, our ability to spot these attacks and thwart them, eliminate those emails, direct them to quarantine, this is going to be super important in making sure that we go left in killing that kill chain uh, before it even penetrates the organization. There are a set of attacks that actually are benign when they come in through the filtering pipeline. They are they look normal. They're actually uh, benign. They do, don't have any malicious content in there. But through attacks, uh, through attack techniques that have evolved over the past few years, attackers can go back and change where the link points to. So if it was pointing to something benign, they can actually go change that to now point to something uh, more malicious. And now it becomes more malicious. So to pair with our prevention logic has to come this active defense layer where we're also detecting what's happening with an email, what's happening with malicious content across Office 365, even post delivery. And so we have a, a, an advanced set of layers that we protect on our with our detection set of stacks and attributes. Beyond that, it's about saying, look, we can do our best with pre prevention and detection, but no solution is 100% effective. So how do we actually partner with our SecOps teams in various organizations, uh, the admins in the various organizations? How do we partner with folks to help them be more effective and efficient at hunting for it, investigating these issues, at expanding their optics into what's gone wrong, and basically reduce the time it takes to discover breaches and mitigate and remediate from breaches. So there's a lot of tools that we work on in terms of manual investigation and hunting capabilities, response capabilities, but also automation to actually help improve the efficacy and the efficiency with which uh, security teams and admin security teams operate. To do all this well, we've got to improve the posture of the organization. So if for those of you who've been monitoring news from us, we've done a lot of work uh, on how do we help the security configuration of Exchange Online? How do we help the security, security configuration of Office 365? Uh, how do we improve the defaults in those cases? And how do we give customers the tools to improve the configuration themselves and the insights to improve those configurations? We've been focusing a lot on these aspects because without this, none of the other layers would matter. You're just opening a wide hole uh, for attackers to come in. So a lot of our default, uh, secure by default strategies, the work we've done to eliminate obvious overrides, all of that focus has been super important to us and has actually yielded great results. And it's an area we continue to focus on. And tying in closely with that is this focus on awareness and training. And so I have this, uh, uh, this saying that I use often that says, your users are effectively your last line of defense, but they're on the front line of attacks. So if you take a look at uh, social engineering attacks, people are effectively trying to dupe users into doing something that they don't intend to do, right? And so it's vitally important for the security posture of any organization to make sure that users feel that sense of awareness, that responsibility to participate in actually evolving the security of the organization to better heights but also report what they see or be able to spot things that are bad better so they don't get duped. So we have a lot of focus on simulation and training capabilities, as well as these, these awareness cues that we bake into our clients, whether it be through safety tips or other informative indicators that help raise the awareness of end users so they don't fall prey to, uh, to these attacks. So those are the pillars. Um, we think each one of these feeds into each other. That's why it's kind of a circular representation here, because without any one of these pegs, the entire story crumbles, and we think we need to invest in all of them, and you've seen us do so to actually bolster the, uh, the value prop uh, of the protection. And on the right are a set of callouts that actually help differentiate us in the marketplace. Um, 
we are natively integrated into Office 365, as some of you may have seen, uh, which means things that uh, for other vendors may require, you know, various uh, configuration uh, hoops that you have to climb through. For us, it's as simple as a checkbox to turn on some of our capabilities, and we've made it increasingly easier. Um, AI and automation, we take pride in uh, the scale of insights and telemetry that we have, not just within Office 365, but across uh, the, the sets of services that Microsoft has. And we pull it all together to build this, this level of security insight over which we can then layer on ML and automation capabilities to help really drive that protection profile. And we have a massive, I think by last count, what does it say, 43 trillion uh, signal bases that we uh, base our automation on. And finally is this comprehensive protection uh, notion, where if you take a look at the picture on the left, that's kind of wearing the Office 365 lens. It's saying, we got to protect comprehensively across each of these dimensions, and we've got to integrate them in terms of experiences. But beyond that, we've got to also think about the broader kill chain that may be orchestrated even beyond Office 365. So David, if you go to the next slide, this is where we think about Office 365 Defender as part of, it's a build slide, so I think you had to go one more, perfect. As, as part of the overall Defender suite of products, right? So it's not just about us sharing intelligence and experiences and workflows within Office 365, but across the Defender suite to Defender for cloud apps, to endpoints, to identities, and making that available in this integrated experience set across the SIM, across XDR, to maximize that protection for customers. I'll leave you with this one thing. Um, attackers don't think in silos, uh, right? They don't wake up one day and say, I'm going to attack just the email component of an organization. They are here to break an organization, right? And so this, this picture that you see represented here is, is, is a evo evolution of that thinking that says the defenses, therefore, cannot think in silos. We've got to offer a solution that looks holistic, that's integrated, that maximizes efficiency and optics for the security teams. And that's what we are after. And we play an important part of that entire uh, view in Defender for Office 365. That makes sense. Um, if you go to the next slide, I'll hand it off to Urja uh, to take us on with the other questions we might have. But I wanted to give you a quick and dirty view into what we'd up to. Thanks, Girish. Can you hear me? I'm having some Teams difficulties, so just making sure. We can hear you, Urja. Yeah. Awesome. OK. Yeah, that was fantastic. I'm uh, hoping that everybody took away a great lot of things uh, about MDO if you were not already aware. And looking at the questions, I'm sure a bunch of folks are already aware of a bunch of things in MDO. I'll start off with uh, uh, one question here, which is a great one to begin this conversation with, uh, deep security. So I'm going to read off the question. We've received a fair amount of pushback from our users about the delay the team's URL scanner is causing. Is there a way to make it more performant or exclude some URLs from scanning, example, internal URLs? The delay is long enough that some users are cutting and pasting the URL and thus uh, circumventing the protection. Uh, so um, why don't <clears throat> I, I've got some of these questions already, Uja, from the, the chat. So um, we do a lot of sort of performance tuning to make sure that the delay and the click is fast, right? There's an API call, it does have to cross networks, et cetera, but it's generally in the order of a couple hundred milliseconds at most. Um, so it looks like these are SharePoint URLs, so there may be something interesting going on in that mix. Um, so I suggested the best thing here would be, let's get a case open and, you know, you can ping me offline there as well, Adam, and we can see what we can do about, um, making sure that we get the right performance there. It's not expected, and we obviously want to make sure that that's a, you know, the experience is such that people don't try and circumvent security by copying and pasting. By the way, if I can just add, I love the question on Teams. Um, I think, uh, I, I, I don't know who mentioned this, but uh, was it Adam? Uh, it, mm -hmm. It's actually, it's insightful because uh, Teams is also an area where we see the level of attacks increasing. Mm -hmm. And our focus there is increasing as well. So you will see us invest a lot more in, in, in the capabilities we offer admins, to your point, Adam. But the performance headaches that you're talking about shouldn't happen, and I'm glad Ross is able to follow up with you offline. 
Thank you, Ross. Thank you, Grish. Thanks, Adam. Um, I know some of the questions are being answered in the chat, so please keep them coming. Uh, there is a hand up. So, Thorsten, I'm going to call upon you if I pronounce your name correctly. Thorsten Kunzi, did you yeah, want to come off mute correctly. and ask your question? Yes. Yep. Basically, I have two questions which might more be feature requests phrased as is that in development? <laughs> um, for one thing, with MDO policies, we um, lack the capability to scope for everything um, right now. Um, so we often have to add domains and then make sure when we buy new domains, uh, the customer the customer has to remember to add them also to be protected for new joint ventures or, or, or something. So it would be great if we have some protect all my domains switch um, in there uh, would be yeah, great to prevent someone not leveraging the, the best protection uh, that we already yeah, want, um, I guess. Why don't you finish your second question, so we can then answer both. <laughs> okay. Um, and the second thing is, as as you mentioned at the start, it uh, MDO started with mail, so it is uh, add-on license to Exchange Online. But um, we often now see customers going to Teams first, pandem uh, pandemic, pandemic, yeah? and um, so we have the requirement um, for SharePoint Teams and all these functionalities um, for MDO. And now we have to assign exchange licenses, even for on-prem mailboxes, and assign then on top the MDO license. And sadly, I have a lot of customers who manage to get their provisioning um, wrong. And assigning an exchange license to a mail to, to a user that has not yet synced its mailbox GUID uh, through Azure AD Connect up means he's gonna get an what he paid for uh, an exchange online mailbox. But then five seconds later, the admin is gonna make him an on-prem mailbox, and this will then lead to some mails being in the cloud mailbox, some in the on-prem mailbox. The user might notice this late, and then we have a lot, have a lot of issues with cleanup, especially if we have. Um, mm. pro, um, policies in place, retention policies in place, then we can't just easily remove the mailbox in the cloud and all that stuff. So mm -hmm. it would be great if we could just keep assigning exchange licenses only once the user is migrated mm -hmm. and not have that in the basic provisioning step, which would create issues. So, Got it. Great questions. Uh, Sandeep, did you want to take on the first one? Yeah. Sandeep, yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's th thanks, Gersh. Yeah. Um, great feedback. Uh, since our uh, release of the preset security policies, the ability to apply the uh, presets to the entire organization, we're hearing a lot of feedback asking for this uh, functionality across all of the uh, policies and the ability to scope all. So yes, definitely something that we're planning. Um, I don't have any timeline at this point, but uh, it's definitely in our roadmap. Cool. Thank you, Sandeep. Uh, and for the second question, to assign exchange licenses only once the user is migrated. Uh, Girish or anybody else, I'm not sure who can answer Yeah, I, I, let me let me take a stab at that. Uh, I think, uh, Ross, you can jump in as well. Um, so I, th I think there's, uh, let me, we went into a little bit of the, the, the problem that happens when you start a license, a license sorry, assigning a license to uh, the, the mailbox. Um, but let me just make sure I understood the intent first. Um, was the intent largely to give them the protection for Team SharePoint OneDrive, uh, but not necessarily MD, I'm sorry, not necessarily email? Was that the intent? Yeah, because usually it starts out with mail flow going to on-prem, so there's no EOP in place. Um, so um, mail is all standard. We need to push Teams now, and we want to have MDO for Teams. And then at some point, mailboxes get moved, uh, MX records get switched, and all, and all the good stuff. But team starts Got first. Got it. So we need the license. Got it. Um, so it, um, Sandeep or Ross can keep me honest here. It is possible to assign, to not assign a license and yet put the user in a policy, I believe. One of Ross, mm -hmm. Sandeep, you can keep me honest. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so you can do that. Just from a compliance standpoint, you still need to have those licenses in terms of your account, of course, but you don't necessarily have to license them in order to get the protection. Does that make sense? Okay, cool. So it's not technically, oh, you're not licensed, so I'm not going to do the, the, the things. Protection, no. And, no. Um, okay. 
okay, because yeah, then would be the non-technical solution to to this problem. We just still not assign MDO, but we have enough licenses, and then we are that's not in good. violation. That, that, that okay, is correct. Great, thanks. It, it's it's good feedback. We may want to reduce that or relax that restriction that you have to have an exchange mailbox or an exchange license to get the MDO license. Um, We'll and even as I understood, it must be assigned within the same group if you do group license assignment. So you, mm -hmm. um, I usually I have a script automating the move to the cloud, and in that script I I also assign the group that then only has the exchange license portion of this E3 E5 license or something. But now it needs to be the, the this group would have need to be bundled with the MDO and and. That was at least at some point my understanding. So it would be really great if it could just be floating independent of other things. Good feedback. Cool. Thanks, Torsten. Um, I'm going to read up the next question here. I believe that's not answered in the chat, but I could be wrong. So correct me if I'm wrong. Is there, this is a question from Huang that. Uh, if I'm pronouncing your name correctly, is there a feature or somewhere in a roadmap in prevention that allows to block emails based on specific selection of curated categories? That is political emails or emails from e-commerce sites, etc. cetera. Or does anybody want but to take that? I, I, I can I can take this. We, we don't do it today. Um, we treat pretty much, we, we have sort of, couple of classifications of mail. Predominantly, it's either, you know, um, spam, fish, malware or bulk. Um, we don't distinguish in bulk email the different types of messages that come through, even, you know, down. In, in a sense, we do distinguish the different types in the sense of, do we believe that the user wants the message or not? And that's based on uh, information about the sender, the way they send, the way that people react to those messages, if they move them to junk, report them as unwanted, etc. So there's, but there's no um, curated categories today of saying, you know, this is a newsletter, this is, you know, um, political campaigns, if those sorts of things. Um, there's no particular plan to add that. I, Girish, I can see you want to add something further. No, I think you're spot on. Um, I, I like where you started. This is. It's it, it's probably obvious, but we'll say it again. We definitely want to make sure that anything that is malicious, we block to the extent possible, right? Uh, and then there's this gray area um, of you know what we refer to internally as bulk mail, and then there's nuisance mail, which is spam, which we also want to block. Uh, and I think uh, Huang, if I'm saying your name right, uh, is uh, your question is in that middle bucket, that bulk bucket around hey. Can I, I want some, but I want to leave some uh, away. Um, our strategy so far has been to identify this broad category of bulk and rely on personalization techniques to actually say, okay, individual users have different biases towards what they want in their mailbox versus not. And so we'll rely on things like focused inbox to help learn from personalization and then figure out what people want to see in their focused inbox versus not. Your feedback is interesting to say, no, can we go one step further and indeed look to classify these emails? So maybe from an organizational standpoint, you want to say, I want to block all politically charged messages. Uh, it's something we should look into, as Ross said, but it's it's not been our strategy so far, but we can take this into consideration. Does that make sense? Awesome. Cool. Uh, next up, uh, I see a hand up. I'm going to call upon uh, Kyle. Did you want to come off mute and speak out your question? And then next, I'll go to Jason in the chat. Yeah, thanks, Urja. I, I wanted to follow up, uh, Goresh, on what you were saying there under bulk, bulk email. Yeah. Um, so, for example, we're a customer that uses third party, a third party product, um, mm -hmm. and we're trying to transition into EOP, MDO. That Everything about Microsoft is really great, minus the bulk, the bulk filtering. Where mm. you know, where our third parties, like you know, whether it's Ironport, Proofpoint, they have concepts that are basically called 
gray male or whatever they want to refer to them as. And within that, so we have, you know, people that have been here, the, the organization is filled with people that have been here for 10 plus years. They may have right. signed up for newsletters that they don't yeah. even remember signing up for. And so their quarantines today get, you know, 100, 200 messages uh, a day. And so right. as we've been trying to trial with people that we know are abusing or have, you know, have a big problem here, it becomes difficult to mm. figure out where that gray line is um, without it seeming like that the service that the service uh, you know for lack of better words it sucks right I see I, I and see. so and so like where where we struggle as administrators is is it's like hey I know that you could go and and go through unsubscribe you could do these types of things but to an end user, they don't know the difference between spam and bulk. That's they're right. just seeing they're just seeing things as unwanted. And so I didn't know. Like we've tried the the, the different strategies. You know, like looking for the list unsubscribe header. I know Microsoft has an article that has like you know those different phrases or things to place in there. But it, it seems like that the the bulk complaint system today mm -hmm. is. Okay, but then there's also like your your big tech target, those types of things. Like, hey, these people are, are legitimately sending good email. These the end users just don't know or remember signing up for this five years ago. It's 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 a great it's it's a great articulation of the human behavior that makes this challenging because every user is different. And what they want is different from each other. Right. But I think you're articulating a a interesting scenario where. You know, on, on another vendor, you may have had, their approach may have been different. You may have had a set of rules, perhaps. Um, and when you make a switch to EOP MDO, we're still in the process of learning that personalization. So the first few days becomes pretty uh, disruptive. I think that's what, if I'm paraphrasing right, what right. you said. Um, it's a good point. In fact, we were, Ross and I and others were having this discussion earlier this morning, coincidentally, where we're saying, okay, if that's the initial if that initial friction while we've still learned the preferences of the user is at, uh, is a problem, we may have to look at something more pointed for that you know, initial phase to compensate for the lack of learning uh, uh, to kind of kind of put the user in a good state once you kind of learn their preferences. Um, it's good feedback, Kyle. I wish I had a clearer answer for you, but the combination of some of the techniques given today, I think informs our strategy going forward and it's something we look at more closely. I, I think it's also worthwhile mentioning that, you know, part of this is us blocking messages or handling them. And part of it is the way that the Outlook clients uh, handle it as well. And we, there's a, you know, there's quite a lot of interaction between uh, the Outlook team and us in order to figure out where, you know, where's the right place and the right balance to be able to, you know, provide the right experience for users. Absolutely. But but good observation, Kyle. Uh, this is definitely an area that uh, we want to lean in more on, and uh, you'll you'll hear more about it from us. Thank you. Cool, thanks, Kyle. Um, next, I know there's some discussion going on uh, with respect to the question that Jason you have posted in the chat. I want to open it up for discussion further. I also have some points to add there. So the question from Jason Chung is, is there a way to stop all emails from some top level domains, TLDs, say China.cn or Russia.ru, et cetera, and all the usual suspect countries? Um, Ross, I know you answered that, that we do have an anti-spam policy, the ability to block mails from certain countries' languages, but not specific TLDs, and you can use exchange transport rules um, with further syntax and regexes and things like that. Um, is there anything further that you would like to add, Ross? So, and then I have some other points I wanted to add on that one. Yeah, no, it's uh, it's interesting. It's come up recently um, as well uh, in a different conversation around blocking TLDs. It's an, it's an interesting concept. Um, you know, as I said, in the AnySpan policy, you can block languages and countries and those sorts of things. Um, we don't generally recommend it because it tends to be false positive prone, you know, um, because you tend to block an entire country of mail that may not be quite the, you know, the right response. But um, I understand certain organizations with certain policies will want to go down these paths. Um, today it's ETRs, but, um, you know, we're starting to hear a little bit more about it. It'd be good um, if you are thinking about that. Are we thinking about 
from domains, like senders, or are we thinking about URL domains in, within the message? So um, both are an interesting concept. Yeah, thank you, Ross. Uh, so just to add to the same problem that you mentioned about uh, unknowingly blocking things that we don't want to block, right? And because anti-spam policy came up, I want to talk about the reverse case of this in terms of allowing. So even in today in the anti-spam policy, what you have is allowed domains and senders. And uh, for many reasons or, you know, many unknown reasons, you as an admin or your organization might not have known or uh, realized why a certain domain was added. Maybe it was added, you know, years ago and now it's there and you have no idea about it. So one thing we are doing as uh, an improvement recently is what uh, what's going to start happening is if you have a list of allowed domains and senders within the anti-spam policy, and if those are uh, intra-org, mainly internal, then uh, an authentication check is going to be enforced on that. And basically our system is going to uh, do a check and say, is this domain really uh, authenticated? Or is this sender authenticated, passes authentication, yes or no? If it does, then only then it's going to be uh, uh, basically, uh, you know, honored. Otherwise, it's not going to be honored if it uh, fails authentication, even though it's specified in the policy. And this is basically just to protect you from um, overly supplying allowed domains that might cause um, malicious activity without you knowing. Um, so it's it's a change that we have announced in the roadmap, and uh, uh, we will start the release on that soon, uh, end of this month. And then slowly it will come through till the next end of the uh, year in, in your tenants as we do a slow rollout. So just wanted to call out that reverse case. So we're, basically, we're figuring out the, this balance between blocking and allowing both ways. I hope that helps. Um, OK, uh, so uh, the next question here is from Huang. Uh, with threat policies, tenant and allow deny list or tenant and allow block list, is there hierarchy where one policy uh, allows or deny list takes more precedence over the other? Uh, tenant so, allow uh, block list? Yeah. Uh, sorry, yeah, I, I, um, I will. I'll, I'll take a stab at it. Um, this is this is a pretty straightforward one. We actually get this up a little, uh, comes up a little bit. Um, when customers create a policy and they put the user in two policies, um, the way the system works is we pick the policy with the highest um, priority, and that policy is applied to the user. Um, if they're in more than one policy, we pick one. So based on the ordering of policies, based on you know, their, um, their uh, uh, order of preference, um, we pick the topmost one. That's the one that gets applied to a user. Um, if we can't find a policy to apply and there is a default policy, that's when we pick up the default policy. So you, there's no sort of hierarchy of policies here. So if one, you know, the organization, you have say three spam policies and you're assigned to all three, only one of those policies will be applied to you based on the order of precedence. Um, and we just take the settings out of that. The other two policies are completely ignored. So there is no hierarchy in that um, sort of allow, deny uh, setup. I, I just add this, this yeah. entire, our, our journey on policy, as you can imagine, has been evolving over the years. We, because we started with EOP and we added on new threat protection policies. Uh, we've been trying to apply some degree of coherence to it over the past uh, year and a half. Um, Sandeep can speak more to this, but with some of you may have seen our, our focus on security templates and built-in protection. Uh, the idea is to try and simplify so you're not having to necessarily, you can still do it if you want to, uh, make these these uh, multiple policy scenarios to actually uh, capture the best protection intent. Um, and I'd, I'd love to hear if folks have feedback on, you know, security templates or built-in protection and where you'd like to see us improve things. Just, just to add to that, for things like Tabl, so the new sort of centralized tenant allow block list um, capabilities, they are applied um, at the tenant level. So they, you know, you could argue there's some sort of hierarchy there. You get that list plus whatever's in policy. Um, you know, if there's an overlap like senders, for example. Um, but 
generally speaking, policies are, you know, a policy is applied to the user. We only use the settings from that policy. Cool. Um, I'm trying to see if there were any questions. I'm scrolling up and trying to see if there were any questions that accidentally went unanswered. Or if folks have uh, further questions, please free, feel free to drop them in the chat or raise your hand. Uh, there's a good question on licensing. Um, I'm going to bow out at the licensing question and throw it over to you, Girish. <laughs> yeah, they, it, um, uh, this is uh, it's a good question. Um, we. Let me let me tell you the, the the thought process behind the licensing. It's not a justification. It's, it's an evolution. Um, uh, and, and then we'll talk about things we are doing to actually help customers be compliant more easily. And this is work in progress, but we hear you loud and clear. So we have we have this vanilla protection in EOP. Uh, and uh, obviously when the when some of these advanced threats happened, we said, hey, we need more advanced layers of protection. Some of them actually they 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 cost a bit. Uh, so we actually charge them. And so we put a lot of our protection uh, prevention logic into kind of the packaging and it was P1. But later we said, hey, the SecOps needs to be a lot more efficient and we need awareness and training. So we packaged a lot of that into P2. Uh, and then we realized that Look, this this advanced level of security actually marries well with uh, advanced capabilities across other security products, and so we have E5 security and M365 E5, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, again, not a justification. It is a little bit of a uh, an eyesore in terms of the different constructs we have, but to the compliance question, the thing we're trying to do is, regardless of how you get a user, uh, and this mixed E5 E3, uh, I get the question. But regardless of how you get the license for the user, whether it be P2, P1, E5, doesn't matter. If you have applied a user some protection, we want to make it apparent to you, the admin, that you have these many users who are getting the benefit of either our pre-breach stack or our post-breach stack. And we make that available to you in an easy to consume uh, card, a report, that you can then look at and say, okay, how does this compare with my license count? Um, and remember, as I said earlier, we don't gate protection of users based on active licenses for some of the scenarios that was brought up by Thorsten. Um, we look at primarily based on configuration of policies. And so we look at those policies and it will inform you what kind of protection you're getting, and that'll help inform you if you're not already compliant on where the gaps are. Does that make sense? I see a thumbs up. I'll assume yes. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, Girish. Uh, oh, my Teams is slowly loading the new messages. Uh, sorry about that. So I don't see any further questions, but um, I do know we had a session on uh, attack simulation training as well, and Girish just mentioned about AST a few minutes back. I was wondering, if folks were aware of um, attack simulation training that we offer, or if you had any questions on that front. Wait, I, I think I heard somebody from the audience ask, hey, what's up next for AST? To which I will happily answer the question. Sure, Brandon, go ahead. Uh, yeah, so traditionally, um, exchange administration uh, and end user education have been two separate domains. So they, they usually are not the same stakeholders, the same persona, um, different parts of the organization and so forth. Um, attack simulation training, uh, I see Tim's question. It is baked right into MDO. So if you go to the security center uh, in the section where you'll see the investigation, explore interfaces and all the configuration stuff, attack simulation training is right there uh, in the list. Um, uh, AST has been in the market about 18 months, 19 months, something like that, uh, and it's a, a very competitive product. It does what a lot of uh, competitor products do uh, today. Great simulation capabilities. You can assess your uh, fish vulnerability with your end users, a very robust catalog of content to engage them. 
Um, we are pivoting our strategy in this semester and starting to work towards a much stronger narrative of efficacy, which is to say we want your fish simulation and training program to be much more about risk reduction, which is to say relevant for anybody that's responsible for you know, messaging ecosystem uh, risks, including fishing and so forth, um, than it is about uh, compliance. Right? So we still fulfill the compliance mission. We know everybody does it uh, on a regular basis. We're gonna be putting a lot more things in place that allow you to measure objectively what your fish susceptibility is, and then engage end users in new ways not just assign a SCORM training course or whatever, but give them games, provide the ability to nudge them uh, at appropriate, appropriate and highly contextual things. We're gonna put a social rewards ecosystem in place because we want end user engagement about their behavior with email, Teams chats and the like uh, to become uh, a thing that you can actually influence uh, as part of your risk model. Does that sound really good? Everyone's very excited. I encourage you to go play with it um, if you haven't uh, uh, seen it. And uh, if you have feedback, um, we would love to hear it, so. Yeah, I, I'd, I'd love to, in fact, make it a little more pointy. Um, our, you know, simulation and training, as you saw in my intro, is, is, is a super critical part to making sure that the organization remains secure because people are attacking end users increasingly, right? Uh, and what Brandon and team have been on the journey of is to say, Rather than just say, look, I want to run a training every six months, we want to actually make the system smart enough to identify the people who need the most training so you can target them and you can measure as a security team and an admin team, you can measure, is that having value? Am I improving the behavior of the user? So that's the fundamental paradigm shift that we're quite excited about. Uh, and, and we'd love to hear feedback to see if you, you buy into that uh, thesis, you want to see more, something different, uh, please tell us. Yeah, our goal here is to make it really just a service that you turn on that just operates and, and does its thing. Uh, you essentially consume reports about uh, its efficacy in changing end user behavior. Uh, we want to remove all of the manual planning efforts to, you know, twice a year, we have to pick a payload and negotiate with a bunch of people and send out this big blast, you know, phishing simulation to all of our users and then big report outs, all that stuff we want to to just turn into a, a flywheel driven by automation um, where you just you know click a button to produce a report that you send to your CISO and your board and say, hey, our fish susceptibility and behavior change program is working wonderfully. Our MDO P2 and or E5 license is really helping us reduce our risk in this area. And a follow-up uh, question came off of that discussion uh, where uh, I'm going to read parts of the questions. Basically, uh, we have seen phishing emails make it directly to the inboxes despite having all the layers in place. Um, the domains had no SPFD came the mark, but it went straight off to the inbox. Anything we can do here to help uh, reduce this from happening? And uh, I know we've responded saying admi admin submissions can help diagnose this. However, the comment is that um, we didn't submit because we didn't want the user to be blocked from to where the actual user's email address is. So maybe um, we can open up to the submissions conversation from this. Uh, David, can you elaborate on your comment on you didn't want the user to be blocked? It just, I'm wondering if there's an assumption there that we want to correct. Just checking, I understood you correctly though. Is it okay if I do it on voice? Yes, please. please. Okay. Um, yeah, so the, the to and the from were the were actual the user's email addresses, right? So they spoofed it. We have the profile pic that shows up in Outlook to give some visual indication that it did in fact come from the user, but it really didn't. And so mm -hmm. if we've submitted it, um, we were concerned that it would end up blocking the user from doing valid email operations. Ah, uh, interesting. Ross, you want to opine? Oh, no, it I does can... not. Oh, oh Jack, yeah, yeah, so, um, yes, uh, so that's, it's a, it's a good question. Um, when, when we get a submission, um, it goes through a process of sort of rescan. So, you know, we run it through the system again to see if anything has changed, but we also have humans look at it um, and grade those messages and give us 
kind of a verdict about the message. So what we extract out of that, and particularly from the sort of human grading, is information about the details of the message, URL, sender, et cetera. But we understand spoof uh, as it comes through. So you shouldn't think that because a user, um, you know, if a, you know, if somebody spoofed a user, and therefore when you make a submission, will sort of um, pick on that user, if you will. Um, it's not not how the system works. We understand that these types of attacks come through, um, particularly around you know the uh, sort of impersonation of CEOs and so on. Um, so my my suggestion here is always go through that process. Um, it helps us pick up lots of information about the message and you know the infrastructure that we use to send it, all of those sorts of details, so that we can come through. Um, and it also gives us an opportunity to highlight you know potentially where things may have been a problem. Um, for example, there may have been an allow in the system or something of that nature. I'm not saying there wasn't in this case, but um, you know, it's it gives us an opportunity to provide that feedback as well. Um, so it's you know, you should never you know sort of hold back from doing a submission. Um, it's handled with the rest of the you know sort of data privacy and security that we have for Office. So um, you know, those sorts of things still apply. Uh, it's it's really the best way to make sure that the system learns and behaves better in those cases. Yeah, thank you, Ross. And uh, just to add to that, uh, rest assured, it's not like that particular sender or uh, user will be blocked from doing email activities. So, and then there is another thing I want to call out on the submissions process that when you are in the process of submitting, uh, there is an option where you can pick and say, allow uh, these type of similar messages as well in the future. And then you can choose an expiry date if you want to, and then it automatically basically just allows that particular entry for your tenant um, if, if you have chosen that option. Or in um, this case, block. Or block, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Or block going forward. Cool. Uh, I think we have three minutes left. Uh, so there is another uh, set of comments in the chat, uh, uh, but just take a look at uh, some of our step-by-step uh, -step guides, recommendations on you know configurations and things. I think those will be really helpful in general. And with that, uh, we have one more slide. If you can proceed next, David, uh, with two small questions to ask you all. Number one, this is kind of a reverse AMA. I think we've already gathered a bunch from the chat that we've had so far. But if you were to pick one thing, what is your most favorite feature in MDU? And if you were, were to pick one thing that can help us, uh, you know, uh, figure out our urgent roadmap on anything, what is that one top of mind feature improvement that you want us to take in MDU? Uh, feel free to come off mute or raise your hand or uh, post in the chat. We'd love to hear that one thing <laughs> for each. I feel like it's hard to choose. <laughs> I guess we heard uh, on the improvement side, we heard the bulk so far. Orca, um, so Orca favorite or improve? Uh, Ed, can you clarify that, please? Favorite safe attachments and improve safe link speed. Good one. Configuration analyzer. Uh, configuration analyzer um, and Orca looks like favorite. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Orca favorite, nice. Favorite safe links and attachments improve more guidance on what to do when a user clicks malicious email. Cool, we'll wait for few more seconds for folks who are typing up their last uh, favorite and improvements, if at all. 
Um, otherwise, we are coming to the close of the session and I'll start with uh, or end with saying thank you all. Uh, this was a great, great session and a great set of comments, feedback, questions from you all. Uh, really happy to be here facilitating all of this for you all. And uh, thanks to everybody in the chat who has been posting questions, answering questions. And uh, great thanks to a huge thanks to Girish for coming over to this. And uh, <laughs> it's my pleasure. This time. I, I love it. I love these things. And uh... I'm, I'm hoping we can do more of these. Uh, I'm super excited that Mech is back. Uh, thank you all for your comments. Thank you for your participation. It's been awesome. Well, thanks, everyone. Take care. Bye.